Good evening. Thank you for joining us and greetings from Marathon. It's good to be back in the Florida Keys this week. FKMCD and OxyTech have just finished a series of five public educational webinars. Thank you for joining us tonight as we launch the first in a series of seven uh, new webinars. We will have one a month from now through March. That's what's been announced so far and we'll probably add more. Our topic this evening is environmental health and OxyTech, benefits for the Florida Keys sensitive ecosystem and endangered species. Presenting tonight, we have Andrea Leal, the Executive Director of the FKMCD. I'm Meredith Benson, OxyTech's Head of Public Affairs and a Florida native. We have Kevin Gorman, OxyTech's Head of Field Operations, and Nathan Rhodes. Nathan is OxyTech's Head of Regulatory Affairs. We are hosting this series of public educational webinars to share information with residents of the Florida Keys and provide forums to answer questions. All webinars are open to everyone. All webinars are recorded and made available for everyone after the event. All questions will be answered. We may group similar questions together and we will prioritize questions that relate to tonight's topic. If time runs out, we will accept questions in writing via florida at oxytech.com. Questions and answers will be published in writing after the event with links to external resources. And all of this is provided on our oxytech.com forward slash Florida page. Just to give you a preview of what is upcoming, in October, we have Human Health and OxyTech, the safety of OxyTech technology. In November, we will have a virtual tour inside OxyTech Labs, and we're pre preparing that content now. It's exciting. Uh, and then in December, we'll look at what's in the box and how OxyTech's Just Add Water technology helps control the Aedes aegypti population. Our agenda uh, tonight includes health economy and the environment, the spread of the invasive disease carrying Aedes aegypti mosquito, rising insecticide resistance, and the benefits of OxyTech's targeted biological control solution. We'll look at regulatory findings, and then we will spend the um, second half of, of, of this hour, so, so the, the, the last 30 minutes, um, taking your questions and we'll provide answers. I'll now turn it over to Andrea for the next part of our presentation. Andrea? Okay, thank you, Meredith. Um, and good evening to everyone out there. Really appreciate you joining in um, to learn a little bit about this project and then answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, one of the main questions that I know that we get quite frequently at the district is, you know, why? Why now? Um, why are we looking at this technology or why are we looking at really any of these new innovative technologies? And the answer is we've really been looking at available tools since right around 2009 and 2010. And um, for those of you that lived in the Keys at the time, you know that that's when we saw our first outbreak of dengue fever in the Key West area. So we had um, just under 100 cases of locally transmitted dengue fever. And then um, we are experienced our second outbreak here 10 years later in the Key Largo area where we've seen uh, 64 confirmed locally acquired cases in this year. So, um, you know, disease issues are always something that has been on our radar at Mosquito Control. Um, you know, specifically Aedes aegypti, because they are uh, carriers not only of dengue fever, but, you know, in 2016, we saw the introduction of Zika in South Florida with Miami-Dade seeing um, hundreds of cases of Zika, um, chikungunya as well, and yellow fever. So um, we really need to focus on controlling uh, those Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So you'll kind of hear a lot about Aedes aegypti and, um, you know, as when I first came into mosquito control, 
you know, I thought a mosquito was a mosquito, but we actually have about 45 different species here in the Florida Keys of mosquitoes. So we're really focusing in on Aedes aegypti specifically. Um, you know, and not only are we worried about those diseases, but um, with all of that, we're also looking at, you know, what are our current tools doing? And unfortunately, we're starting to see insecticide resistance um, in our local mosquito populations which again is another reason why we are looking at, um, you know, this tool as long as, as well as many others. Um, and we you know we're ex extremely interested in, in trying to find new innovative ways to control um, Aedes aegypti. Um, as we're looking at these new tools coming in, Obviously, environmental impact is a major concern for us. You know, we're surrounded by um, protected waters. There are protected lands throughout the Keys. And we want to do our best here at Mosquito Control to be as environmentally sensitive as we possibly can. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying to steer away from broad scale insecticides as much as we possibly can. Right now, that is a last resort for us when we see high populations or um, disease transmission going on. Um, that is when we'll use broad scale insecticides decides. Um, so again, you know, this, this particular method we are very excited about because it is, you know, specific to Aedes aegypti. You know, we aren't worrying about um, any other environmental impacts that we may have out there. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Aedes aegypti specifically. Um, it is not native to the Florida Keys. Uh, it comes from Africa and has actually kind of moved around um, the, the entire globe over time. Um, and we continue to see it moving as uh, warmer weather continues, uh, moving up in the United States specifically. So really we're focusing on control of an invasive disease carrying species. Um, another common question that we get is, you know, what happens when we remove Aedes aegypti specifically from the environment? And um, I think it's, you know, a great question. And when you're looking at the mosquitoes in the Florida Keys, we're really only looking at between, you know, two and 4% of our mosquito population is Aedes aegypti. You know, the main mosquito that we see is the salt marsh mosquito. And that is the mosquito that's really important to our environment down here. So the mosquito larvae uh, in the salt marshes will feed uh, fish, aquatic insects, et cetera. And those are also the major biomass. So as we're talking about uh, birds, other insects, um, bats in other areas, you know, those are the type, those are the mosquitoes that we're really looking at uh, part of the food chain. So we're focusing on an invasive species uh, that is, you know, very small population comparatively in the Florida Keys. Um, and again, uh, is really the major cause of diseases uh, in our area specifically. Next slide, please. And then again, bringing it back to resistance, you know, we're not the only ones seeing resistance to current insecticides that are out there. Um, the University of Florida has put together uh, quite a bit of compiled information over the last couple of years showing resistance that's occurring uh, throughout Florida and, you know, really throughout all of the places that these insecticides have been used. Um, so this is a big issue for us as as it really is taking off of the table some of the tools that used to be effective for us. So um, luckily here in the Florida Keys, we've got a couple of active ingredients that we can still use um, that are still very effective for Aedes aegypti. However, um, you know, it is moving more and more resistant to a number of these different uh, insecticides. So um, really emphasizing the point that if we want to be able to control these mosquitoes specifically, we're going to have to really think outside of the box and, and look at some of these innovative tools that are, that are coming down the pipe now. And I think with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kevin. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Uh, that was great. Super, super comprehensive and, uh, and really touches on a lot of the slides that uh, I'd like to present. Um, I've got a few slides here and this first one um, with just really as a recap uh, for most people, I imagine, but maybe uh, new information for some. Uh, and it really just talks about the, the different benefits and the different features uh, of this particular biological control tool uh, known as OX5034. Uh, this is Oxitec's uh, second generation Aedes aegypti. Uh, 
So this product, uh, as we'll call it, um, is essentially a male-only mosquito. Uh, we are able to put eggs into a box with a just out of water approach. And because uh, we have a self-limiting gene which kills females, uh, only males survive. And those males are able to release themselves out of that box, giving a very hassle-free, um, easy uh, operational approach to releasing this, this biological tool. And often biological tools you know, are a little bit more complex uh, than some other traditional tools and, and can be quite costly uh, to release operationally. And so this really, really transforms uh, the scalability and accessibility of biological tools or, or this particular one. So some of the key features are that it, it's that male only release. It's pure male releases and we can't really release female, we can't release females even if we try from these boxes. So, so um, it becomes a very low tech, uh, very uh, foolproof system uh, for releasing pure male cohorts of 5034 Aedes aegypti. Uh, it gives very targeted suppression, as, as Andrea's talked about. It, uh, it is a mating-based technology, so it only affects this, this particular species. There's no direct or indirect impacts on any other species out there because it's just such a low level of, of, of food for any other uh, uh, items, uh, animals in the food chain. And, uh, and as I mentioned, because it's got that species specificity due to the fact that it's a mating-based approach. So our males are released from the boxes and they go out and they mate with wild females and those wild females can't produce female offspring. They do produce male offspring and those male offspring uh, work in the same way as our released males, uh, mating with more wild females and giving us uh, improved efficacy and uh, more bang for our buck, if you like, uh, with lots of off male offspring uh, working uh, for each male parent that we release. It's safe uh, for the environment, as I mentioned. It's non-toxic, it's non-allergenic, uh, and uh, many regulatory agencies around the world, uh, including many, including federal and state regulators uh, in the US, have determined that this is safe to humans, to the environment, and to animals. It's traceable in the field. Uh, we have a fluorescent marker, which is uh, ingrained into the mosquitoes. Uh, it's inherited along with the self-limiting gene, and that expresses in all life stages of both males and females. So that enables us to track uh, males or females, uh, and uh, uh, females, of course, aren't produced, but it allows us to detect them should they be produced uh, at any life stage, larvae, pupae, or adults. Uh, this is a, a great uh, convenient tool for surveillance because it allows us not only to just track and trace and see where our mosquitoes go, which is, of course, uh, very useful and interesting, but it also allows us to assess the performance, to see how well we're doing, and to see what percentage of the population uh, we're actually managing to control. And then we can adjust the rate accordingly, maximizing efficiency and ensuring that uh, we really do uh, give a very cost-effective solution. It's self-limiting uh, because the males themselves uh, are the only ones that carry on that, 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 uh, that phenotype, uh, that, to, that gene to their offspring. Uh, the females die and each generation uh, it, uh, reduces by half in terms of its uh, frequency. So in a half-life fashion, it dies out over the course of about five to ten generations. You can see uh, a picture of the box there in the bottom left-hand corner and the capsuled eggs uh, also on the left-hand side and the various life stages with the fluorescence marker lit up in the right-hand pictures. So this next slide uh, really just talks about uh, one of the environmental benefits and the following few slides that I'll talk about uh, take on a different environmental benefit and uh, I'd just like to explain a little bit about each of them. <clears throat> Andrea's touched on some of these in her introductions. And this particular slide is really to talk about sustainability. Uh, as mentioned, it's a biological mating-based tool. There are no chemicals here, so that means there's no active site for a chemical to work on, which means there's no you know, target site in which, which, can, which can be altered and, uh, by mutation and, uh, um, and provide uh, an avenue for, insect, for, for resistance to develop. Uh, so this particular biological strategy is not prone to resistance development as a result, and therefore you know, uh, there is the possibility that it could be very sustainable. 
In addition, uh, it's something that can be integrated with current tools. It's something that can be used in rotation or in other strategic manners with uh, the conventional tools that are already available or potentially new tools that are yet to come through. And so those combina that combination of being able to integrate and not having a, uh, a profile or a, or a, um, that is prone to resistance development means that a, a multifaceted approach uh, could offer a very long life uh, for uh, effective ADs Egypti management. Reduced reliance on insecticides. Um, insecticides have their place. Uh, they can be extremely useful. Where would we be without them? To be honest, uh, over many, many decades now, they've played a, a vital role in public health and agriculture and a number of areas. And, uh, and that will continue uh, without a doubt. Um, we see this technology as uh, providing another tool uh, that, that people can use. Uh, they can, they'll be able to choose the right tool for the right job and as I mentioned in the previous slide, it, it, it becomes a tool that can be integrated. So there's the possibility of a true integrated strategy to, to be developed, in which case reliance can switch from one tool to another. Um, reducing reliance on single tools means that resistance is less prone to develop. And um, very interestingly, 5034, when it suppresses the population, it will introgress insecticide susceptibility into the population. And that itself can actively reduce insecticide resistance just through sheer dilution uh, with susceptible genes. So the combination of, of a reduced reliance on insecticide or reduced use of insecticide, which will slow resistance development, is synergized by this effect of resistance dilution using OX 5034. And the combination of these things mean that the reliance on chemicals can be reduced and the effectiveness of chemicals can be increased. No ecological footprint. Uh, this is a super important feature. Um, in many um, environments, uh, um, you know, they're unique. They're all unique and they have uh, unique ecosystems that need to be protected. Uh, native ecosystems, um, which which should be protected from invasive species and um, need to be carefully managed. In this case, um, we see uh, this is a biological approach which leaves no, which has no persistence, no long term effect. These males die out uh, in a half life kind of fashion. It's only releasing males. There's no persistence of the transgene. And although uh, we intentionally introgress some of the insecticide susceptibility and background genes, uh, there's no uh, uh, persistence of, the, of those introduced genes. And so uh, once we've stopped releases within a very short space of time, just a matter of a few generations, uh, our males have disappeared and the, uh, the, the, there is no trace left in the environment in terms of uh, our introduced genes. So what that means is that um, um, there's no long-term effect like some strategies, there's no direct effects on the rest of the ecosystem and uh, uh, should new technologies come along, uh, there's no irreversible or long-term change uh, that has been applied by using this kind of technology. Uh, super important in sensitive ecological areas such as the Florida Keys and elsewhere. Uh, a lot of these mosquitoes have been uh, uh, released to date, uh, or our first generation mosquitoes, over a billion in total, uh, over a decade of releases in different countries and different continents. And uh, this has been monitored in every single field trial. Uh, we always monitor uh, due to you know, uh, our need and desire for information as well as uh, for regulatory compliance. So we always monitor that disappearance of the transgene, and that happens in all cases. Another environmental benefit is the potential to restore native ecology and habitat. Um, as I mentioned and, uh, and, and Andrea talked about earlier, uh, it is an invasive species. It's more recently, most recently, in you know, the last couple of hundred years, it's moved around the world, uh, primarily due to the movement of, of, of people and transport uh, that human traffic and trade has, has, has uh, provided uh, vehicles for Aedes aegypti to invade new areas. And of course, then there's climate change, which also allows 
uh, Aedes aegypti and other species to expand their distributions and host ranges. And that's certainly the case with Aedes aegypti, which is expanding uh, seemingly year on year. As an invasive species, it really doesn't belong in the Florida Keys. And in, in fact, in most of the regions where it is uh, causing trouble today. And it has the potential uh, to impact native biodiversity as a consequence of that invasion. Um, it does uh, have it uh, urbanized areas where uh, you could say ecology is, is more limited, uh, but the fact remains that it's a, a non-native species and removing it or reducing it should uh, provide uh, the ability for native species uh, to gain a stronger foothold and, uh, and, and remain prevalent in the area. I'm going to hand over to uh, Nathan now, who's going to finish off with the next few slides. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, so I just wanted to spend a moment on this slide talking about the particularities of the ecosystem in the Florida Keys. Um, the Florida Keys has several protected species, um, and I've listed them here. This is taken from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, their listing of species by county. So the protected species in the Keys include several birds. Um, I've listed nine of those here, including the red knot and the Florida scrub jay, which are pictured there. In terms of mammals, obviously the key deer is a well-known uh, protected mammal in the Keys, um, particularly around Big Pine. Um, and some of you will be aware that the key deer actually several years ago um, were in danger from another insect species. Um, where the New World screwworm is actually starting to impact key deer populations. And the release of sterile male screwworm was actually able to help eradicate that population and protect the key deer in that sensitive habitat there. And that's quite a similar approach to what we're doing here with the Aedes aegypti mosquito as well. Um, several other mammals, obviously. Um, one of them pictured here is the Florida bonneted bat. Andrea mentioned earlier um, in terms of bats and, and some of their uh, food targets might include the, the really prevalent mosquitoes in the Keys, like the salt marsh mosquito. Um, and then when it comes to reptiles, insects and mollusks, obviously some of these are marine. Um, some of them may be in, in freshwater or estuaries as well. Um, and then particularly uh, four species of butterfly which are found in the Keys, which are protected. And uh, at least one of those shown here, the Shouse swallowtail butterfly. And Andrew talked earlier about the really the desire to try and minimize insecticide usage to when it's really needed when you're using broad spectrum inspected insecticides for disease prevalent situations and so on. And that's obviously related to, to some of these uh, protected insect species and the desire to be able to protect those as well. Okay. So what I'd like to do on the next slide is just to talk briefly about how the regulators looked at the environment when they were assessing the impact of this particular project, the release of Oxitex mosquitoes. Um, and firstly, just to give the conclusion which the regulators, both the federal regulators, the EPA and the Florida state regulators came to was that there would be no effects on endangered species or critical habitat um, where the direct, and that basically means something that might eat one of the Oxitec male mosquitoes, or indirect. So what happens if you reduce the population of Aedes aegypti? Um, in looking at this, they looked at the species that I've just mentioned, fish, birds, mammals. They looked at plants as well, other invertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, things that might eat insects, and other aquatic animals as well. And some of their conclusions included um, the finding that Aedes aegypti is really a negligible part of bird, amphibian, or bat diets. As Andrea was saying earlier, Aedes aegypti is a very small percentage of the mosquito population in the Florida Keys. Um, and even then, mosquitoes tend to be a, a very, very small proportion of the diet of things like birds and bats, simply because they're not enough calories in a mosquito to make it worthwhile. In many cases, they will go for larger insects moths and beetles and other things which are more efficient as part of their diet. So the other important finding is that the male mosquitoes released um, cannot bite people or wildlife. Um, and this is because the male mosquitoes simply do not have the mouth parts actually to be able to bite. Um, and so when it comes to potential indirect effects reducing the population, um, the EPA found negligible effects there. 
They also looked at direct effects. So what happens if something was to eat an Oxitec mosquito, let's say a larva or a pupa. And for that, we supplied quite a lot of data um, generated by third party independent labs looking at animals that might actually eat these mosquitoes. For example, freshwater fish or invertebrates that eat uh, the 5034 mosquito larvae fare exactly the same as fish and invertebrates that eat non-genetically modified mosquito larvae. There is no difference. Um, the, the two genes which are introduced and the proteins which they make in the mosquito are non-toxic, non-allergenic, and they're digested exactly the same as the non-genetically modified mosquitoes. So a lot of data went into this analysis, and I'm just highlighting a few of the points here. Um, but the conclusion from both the federal and the state regulators was that this is safe for the local environment uh, in the Florida Keys. And a lot more information on this is available through some of the links on the Oxitec website, which will take you to the very extensive and comprehensive uh, environmental analysis that was done by the, particularly the federal regulators, the EPA. So it's worth taking a look at that if you have more questions as well. Okay, a couple of other topics I'd like to cover briefly, which were also covered by the regulators in their assessment of environmental impact. Um, they looked at whether 5034 mosquitoes could potentially spread antibiotic resistant bacteria. That's a question which has come up and concluded there was negligible risk that this would happen. Um, negligible risk of spreading antibiotic resistant bacteria in the environment in the US. And that was based on a very detailed analysis of the production processes for the mosquitoes, as well as various other factors. And again, more information is available in the risk assessment documents through our website. They looked at off-target impacts, as I've just mentioned, on a number of different organisms um, and concluded that there would be no adverse effects anticipated for non-target organisms as a result of the release of these mosquitoes. They also looked at endangered species um, and made a no effect determination. Um, basically, there will be no effect on endangered or threatened species in the Florida Keys or for their designated critical habitats. And then finally, they also looked at what happens to the environment as a result of the release of these mosquitoes and the, the genes which they will share with the local wild mosquitoes and concluded that while introgression of the background genes in the, the released mosquitoes uh, into the local wild mosquito population is likely to occur, the risk resulting from an introgression of the background genes is negligible. And again, that was a very carefully studied uh, part of their risk assessment, and that was done in collaboration with the CDC as well. Okay. So I've talked about the EPA quite a bit. Um, this was also assessed by several Florida uh, departments as well. The Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services has overall authority over any new uh, insect control tool. And so they coordinated reviews then from other parts of the Florida state government, including the Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and the Florida Department of Health as well. And so all of these together, unanimously approved the permit uh, and also found that there would be negligible impact on the local ecosystems as a result of the release of these mosquitoes. So finally, just to summarize um, everything that we've been saying, uh, there is definitely an increasing threat of disease transmission uh, in the Florida Keys as is being seen this year with the dengue cases in Key Largo. Um, at the same time, the, the ways to control the Aedes aegypti mosquito are under threat through, due to insecticide resistance. And so this particular mosquito control tool, um, which will be evaluated in this project, uh, is highly targeted against just this one species, which ensures absolutely minimal impact on any other species in the wider environment in the Florida Keys. And the use of these mosquitoes also has the potential to reduce the reliance on insecticides for Aedes aegypti control, which is obviously something which is desirable in the local environment. Um, protecting against this invasive species may also help to promote native biodiversity. And finally, sustainability of mosquito control is going to require tools that have long-term performance without long-term impact on the environment. And we think that this particular mosquito control tool has the potential to provide that. And that's certainly what we see from our projects using this tool in other parts of the world, particularly in Brazil. Okay, I'm gonna pass this back to Meredith at this point.
Thank you, Nathan. We'll start with our questions now. I, I should have said earlier, we are not going to identify who is asking uh, the questions. We, we want you to feel comfortable to ask anything at all you are curious about. So please send your questions in. We, we will not identify um, who, who is asking the questions. We've received a number of questions, so we'll start answering them now. Uh, the first question I can answer, the question is, what is the email address to ask questions? Um, the email address that, that we've established to answer questions about this project is florida at oxytech.com. And I believe if FKMCD also has an email address that, um, that that people can use. Andrea, could you let us know what that is? Yes, it's questions at keysmosquito.org. Great, so we've got questions at keysmosquito.org and florida at oxytech.com. And the second question is, and I'll, I'll send this to either uh, Kevin or Nathan. You, you guys can de decide who, who wants to take this one. The question is, can you explain how the two genes in OxyTech mosquitoes do not persist in the environment? Um, do you want me to take that or do you want to take that, Kevin? Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Nathan. That's great. Okay. So the genes that are in the mosquito, um, as we've described, will ensure that any female mosquito that inherits those genes will die. Um, any male mosquito that inherits those genes can pass those on to their offspring. Um, but what's important in understanding how these genes eventually disappear from the environment is, is to think a little bit about how they're inherited. So the mosquitoes that are released will have two copies of each of these genes, and that means that all of their offspring will inherit one copy of the genes. Um, just like if you think about human inheritance, um, you can think about uh, people who are carriers of a particular gene. Um, that that's, helps to make sure that their offspring will actually inherit that particular gene. So the males are carriers of two copies of these genes, and this means that all of their offspring will end up with one copy. And then those female offspring that get a copy will die, but the male offspring that get a copy of these genes will then be able to pass that on. But now, when they pass on that, that copy of their genes, only half of their offspring will actually get a copy of those genes. And then the next generation down, only a quarter will end up with a copy of those genes and then an eighth and, and so on. And it'll eventually disappear entirely from that population. Uh, because in every successive generation, um, only half of the, the offspring will actually be able to inherit a copy of those genes. But at the same time, uh, we have the overall population decreasing dramatically because we're not actually able to produce any females. And so you have this combined effect of the population going down dramatically, and that's what we see in Brazil. We see up to 95% reduction in the population, but we also see this dilution of the genes which have been passed on. And so those two effects together um, basically ensure that the genes that are in the mosquitoes that are released will not persist in the environment long term. And this is what we see. So in Brazil, where we've released the OX5034 mosquitoes, we've seen that within about three or four months after the end of releases, those genes, so the self-limiting gene and the fluorescent marker gene, are completely gone from the environment. And we've seen this over two years of releasing these mosquitoes in Brazil. Um, and this matches the modeling that's also done to explain how these genes disappear. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Nathan, our next question is for you also. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if a lizard or fish eats Oxytec mosquito larvae, what happens to the lizard or fish? Why doesn't Oxytex mosquito have an impact? Okay, so that's a really good question. And that's something which the regulators also looked at. Um, 
And the reason is that the genes themselves, the DNA, is digested just like any DNA is digested when you eat a piece of meat. Um, and the same is true for any digestive system. Um, so there's no way for those genes to transfer into the lizard or the fish. Um, they'll just get digested. The proteins which those genes produce in the mosquito, so the fluorescent protein and the self-limiting protein, which causes the death of the females, those are entirely non-toxic and non-allergenic. So if anything eats those, whether it's a mammal, whether it's a fish, whether it's a lizard, whether it's another insect, they will just be digested in exactly the same way as any other protein, which is part of that mosquito. So they have no difference in terms of nutrition. They have no difference in terms of their impact on the ability to digest that mosquito. And that's been backed up with experiments uh, done by third party labs where these mosquitoes were actually fed to fish. They were fed to invertebrates, they were fed to other insects and so on. Um, and with all those experiments, there was absolutely no difference between a fish that eats a non-genetically modified mosquito and a fish that eats one of the oxytate mosquitoes. So there is a lot of scientific data to back that up as well. Thank you, Nathan. And sorry to send you three questions in a row, but I, I think this next one uh, might be best suited for you too. The question is, can you explain more about why mosquitoes develop resistance to pesticides. Why don't Oxitec mosquitoes generate resistance? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll start just by talking a little bit about how resistance to insecticides works and, and how it can develop, and then I'll talk about Oxitec after that. Um, most insecticides are chemicals, and so they're a bit like drugs for humans in the sense that they are designed to target a particular part of the mosquito's cell or a particular protein that's in the mosquito uh, or a particular neurotransmitter that's in the mosquito <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and so <coughs> when that mosquito is exposed to that insecticide it will target that particular part of its uh, its physiology and that will then stop its physiology working properly. That'll often lead to the death of the mosquito. And you can think about that targeting a bit like a key fitting into a lock. The insecticide has to fit perfectly into that part of the mosquito's cellular structure to have its impact. And if there's anything that's changed about that structure, just like if you have a lock and that lock gets damaged, the key will no longer fit in and it'll no longer be able to turn properly. And so that's kind of how resistance develops. If you have the target of that particular insecticide changing in any way, then the chemical can no longer fit properly um, and it will no longer be able to have its effect. And that can happen spontaneously and that'll happen through genetic mutation. So genetic mutations in the mosquito might cause the target of that particular insecticide to change shape and that stops the chemical from being effective against the mosquito anymore. And what will then happen is that if you have some mosquitoes that are resistant to an insecticide through mutation, um, they will have basically a survival advantage. Mosquitoes that are not resistant will die, and so the mosquitoes that are resistant will be able to survive, pass on that mutant gene to their offspring, um, and so on. And then eventually, over time, a whole population of mosquitoes can become resistant to an insecticide. And that's what we're seeing all over the world, is that unfortunately, insects are becoming resistant to the insecticides that are used currently. Um, so to talk about Oxitec mosquitoes and why they don't generate resistance, this is because the self-limiting gene in the Oxitec mosquito um, is not targeted by, it, it's, not, it's not a chemical. It's not targeting just a specific part of the mosquito's cellular structure. What it actually does is it targets thousands of different parts of the cellular structure, which are all different, and it stops the cells from functioning normally. And for resistance to develop, there would have to be many, many, many mutations all occurring at the same time. And that's, that's not possible. That cannot happen because any of those mutations would cause the mosquitoes to die. And so <clears throat> it's, it's extremely, extremely unlikely that resistance to the Oxitec self-limiting gene could actually develop. And this is the finding of the regulators who've looked at this as well. 
Um, and we have released these mosquitoes for about 10 years now using this particular self-limiting gene in various parts of the world. As Kevin said, about a billion mosquitoes released and we've never seen resistance to this throughout these 10 years of releases as well. So it was a bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope that is able to answer the question. Thanks very much, Nathan. Um, the next question is going to go to Kevin, and it is a question and a comment. And it is, thank you for providing this information and facilitating discussion. What is your timeline for the mosquito release? Great. Uh, well, really appreciate the uh, the compliment, and uh, great that we're that we're getting the discussion uh, that you want. Um, the timeline for release uh, is 2021, ideally. Uh, we have uh, an end of uh, target date from the EPA of uh, April, late April 2022, and we won't be releasing before the start of 2021, and we'll be assessing uh, the impact of COVID. You know, before and having having a formal decision on whether we proceed. Uh, prior to the project taking place. Mosquito season in Florida is starting around about March, April time. And so we are hoping that we can get out for the start of that mosquito season. So March, April, 2021, that would be ideal for us. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, our next question will we'll also go to you, Kevin. I mean, this, this is an Oxytech specific <coughs> question. It, and the question is, what is in the fluorescent powder added to the boxes? I thought the fluorescent marker was inserted into the DNA of the mosquito, not dusted on top. I would like to know what it is composed of. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we, we do have a fluorescent marker that's integrated into the mosquito, if you like. It's a, uh, as shown in the pictures previously, you know, it, it, it shows up under certain wavelength, wavelengths of light under a microscope in the laboratory. And that is evident, and we, we use that, of course. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, you can use commercially available uh, powders or liquids, uh, which are sold for precisely uh, this purpose. And you can dust insects, you know, for releases, uh, or you can you, you can use liquids, and uh, that's useful if you want different colours because you might want to distinguish between releases on one day from releases on another day, for example. So it could be uh, that in our experiments we might want to do that and have additional uh, physical markers, if you like, ones that are outside, you know, on the insects. And these are just commercially available products. They come with a variety of different ingredients, but you can just buy them off the shelf. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, the next question is going to go to you, Nathan. And the question is, some consider this synthetic, some consider this synthetic genetic pollution of our ecosystems. What long-term evolutionary testing and off-target mutation analysis can you provide to show it will never have negative consequences on our environment? Okay. Do you want me to Thanks repeat that, Nathan? No, I, I think I've got it. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I would say is that the the real genetic pollution of the ecosystem is the presence of the Aedes aegypti mosquito in the first place. Um, and studies, which Andrea highlighted in one of the earlier slides, have shown when those mosquitoes first came to the Americas and where they came from. They come from Central Africa and they made it over to the Americas probably in the 16th century initially, um, and then moved from South America up to North America a little bit later. So that's really the, the genetic pollution of the ecosystem, if you like. Um, the Oxytec mosquitoes, uh, which are released, will not have long-term persistence in the environment. Um, and so that there is no synthetic pollution of the environment and there are also no long-term impacts. Um, and that's something we've monitored in every single field release so far in other places. Um, it's also something that is a natural effect of the self-limiting genes, as we were describing earlier. Um, and it's also something that's been studied by other scientists, not Oxitex scientists. For example, a study that was published last year on Oxitex first generation mosquito in Brazil 
showed the same thing that there was no long-term impact of the either the the, the self-limiting gene and the fluorescent gene those were gone very quickly and even the background genes which are introgressed were disappearing within about two years as well so there is no long-term persistence um, and that's that's something which has been looked at very carefully by the regulators as well and so the data that they looked at is available in their risk assessments which are available through the Oxitec website, which will take you to the EPA list of documents as well. Um, okay. Thanks very much, Nathan. The next question is for you also. Um, then I promise the one after that is, is going to Andrea. Um, but this next question, Nathan, is does Oxitec need to conduct controlled biological tests on the endangered species down here who eat them or can be bitten by those females that don't exist to show that the mosquitoes won't have, have an impact on them. What are the many, why are the many tests that the EPA required of Oxitec sufficient? Do you want me okay. to replace that, Nathan? Uh, no, I, I, think I've got, I think I've got that, thank you. Um, so, does Oxitec need to control control need to conduct control biological tests on the endangered species? Uh, no, that's not something which is permitted. Um, instead, what is done in any type of science is that instead you will carry out tests on what's called a model species, something which is close enough to all of the other species. So you might choose a particular freshwater fish, which will then represent freshwater fish more generally or you might choose a particular insect which is representative of other similar insects. And so that's standard in the sciences is that you choose a species which you can actually uh, handle in the lab and which you can do experiments with and also a species which is not rare or protected. And that's a responsible way to do the experiments. And so what the EPA required of Oxitec was to do experiments on these model species to show that there was no impact on them when they eat Oxitec mosquitoes. Uh, and so I've talked about those already, but those include things like freshwater fish and invertebrates and so on. Um, and the summary of those studies is available again through the EPA's risk assessments. Um, the second part of the question, I think, talked about endangered species that could be bitten by female mosquitoes. Uh, we're not really seeing any female mosquitoes. So the self-limiting gene ensures that only male mosquitoes can be released and they cannot bite anything. So that's not a concern. Um, and the question about why are the tests that EPA required of Oxitec sufficient? Um, so the EPA and other federal agencies which do similar things, whether it's USDA or FDA, have a clearly defined set of tests which they have developed over several years, which help them to evaluate risk. Um, and so it's not an attempt to test every single species that could possibly exist, but instead they focus on species which are good indicators or good models to help them in, uh, assess potential impacts on the environment. And that way you are actually conducting more ethical scientific process because you are reducing the number of animals that you're actually testing things on as well. And that's an important thing to do too. So they have defined a particular list of species that needed to be tested. We followed that list and that's the data that we actually provided to them. Thanks very much, Nathan. And this next question is for Andrea. The question is, in which habitats are wild Aedes aegypti commonly found? In which habitats will the Oxitec mosquitoes be released? So Aedes aegypti are found in urban, in urban environments. Um, really any container that can hold about a tablespoon of water, we have found Aedes aegypti in, um, commonly found in five gallon buckets, uh, potentially garbage cans, garbage can lids, kids' toys, um, tarps, boats. Um, I probably could name another 20 to 25. Um, I think my favorite of all time that we've ever found is actually the plastic base of a mosquito magnet was found producing Aedes aegypti. So, you know, someone was growing their mosquitoes and then collecting them immediately after. Um, so really you can find it uh, around people's homes. They, they feed on humans. Um, they are not uh, gonna be found, you know, out in the middle of mangrove areas. They wanna be around people. Um, they wanna come in your home if you will let them. 
So um, we're, we're really looking at doing these releases you know, on, on people's property, around their homes where we are finding uh, those wild Aedes aegypti populations. Thank you, Andrea. The next question is for Kevin. And that next question is, how quickly do you expect to see an impact on the wild mosquito population? And how would you define success for this project? Right, super. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, super question. Uh, I'll take it in two parts. First one uh, being the speed of impact. Um, <clears throat> so we release our male mosquitoes and they get to work straight away. So those, those initial mosquitoes will come out of the boxes, takes a, a couple of weeks um, at most for those males to come out of those boxes and start to mate with wild females. Uh, those females won't have female progeny. And so we get very early effect. Just uh, literally within a few weeks, we'll start to see uh, that those mosquitoes are mating and causing the death of females and reducing those number of females. And then with successive releases over time, that effect will become stronger and stronger and stronger. And so uh, it can be very quick. And as you saw, you know, uh, as people have seen in, in the charts and the data previously, uh, we've had over 90 percent effect, you know, in just a matter of, of 13, 14, 15 weeks um, in certain locations. Depends upon the number of mosquitoes there uh, and, a number, and, a, and a range of things. But essentially, we start to see the effects pretty much straight away. And it's just about uh, proceeding with that. Uh, in terms of success of the project, well, I'm going to um, I'm going to lean on Andrea a little bit here because at the end of the day, it's about making the tool uh, available and, uh, and and workable uh, for, for vector control districts. And so, uh, of course, we love to see a really strong level of suppression to demonstrate that the technology works really well. But maybe Andrea, um, you know, you could say a little bit about the kind of you know, uh, percentage kills that you get currently uh, with tool and, um, you know, how, you know, what you might be looking for in a new tool. Well, I think ultimately, you know, it's, it's a matrix of all things. Um, you know, once a product is commercially available, uh, the district does an extensive cost benefit analysis. So how well does it work? Um, and how much is it going to cost us? And is it worth it? Um, so really, those are all the things that we're going to look at with this project um, at the end of the day. Um, some of the newer things that we've started doing for Aedes aegypti control have shown um, control of just over 50% of populations. Um, you know, is that an acceptable level? Well, at the end of the day, it depends on how many mosquitoes we're collecting in those traps and if we can remain below what we consider the, the disease transmission threshold. So um, it really is going to be a, a lot of information that we're going to collect and um, ultimately sit down and say, is this, how well does it work and is the cost um, worth that? So um, I think that, you know, we're, we're quite a ways out before making decisions like that. Um, but, you know, we've got to start here. We've got to know, does it work here? And, and what kind of levels are we seeing of it as far as effectiveness? Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Andrea and Kevin. Our next question will go to Nathan. And Nathan, the question is, what third-party labs tested sensitive species and where are the studies for toxicity and other negative effects due to consumption? Okay, thanks for that question. Um, so first of all, just to say the studies that were done were, as I mentioned earlier, requirements from the EPA. Um, and those were to, to basically assess what happens if, if particular species eat these mosquitoes. Um, and those studies found that there was no negative effects on those species. Um, those studies were done by uh, independent labs uh, in the UK and other parts of Europe. Um, and basically, these are trusted laboratories that have a track record of doing these kind of studies in a robust scientific way um, and generating data that is of good enough quality to be assessed by regulators. And so that's what we did in these cases, is we found labs that would actually be able to carry out these studies effectively. 
Um, and the, the studies themselves, the summaries of, of the data and so on, again, those can be found through the EPA website. Uh, follow the links from the Octatech website if you want to see those. So I hope that helps. Thanks you. very much, Nathan. Thank you. This next question, um, I'll send it to Andrea first, and then Kevin, you may you may wish to add some things. But Andrea, to start, the question is, can you expand on why the Florida Keys is the first region in the U.S. to release Oxytec mosquitoes? Is it because there is a mosquito control board to liaise with or is there something about the region itself? Yes, so we really first were looking at this technology um, back when we had uh, our dengue fever outbreak in 2009 and 2010. Um, I actually ran into uh, an Oxitec employee at, I think it was the American Mosquito Control Association's annual meeting. Um, and really, <laughs> That whole meeting, I think I, I definitely spent most of the time talking with folks that were, you know, Mexico, South America, people that, that deal with these disease outbreaks on a regular basis, um, which, you know, we really had never done before, um, at least not in the Florida Keys. Um, I think our last dengue outbreak was mid, mid 1950s. So, um, so really, just trying to gather information on, on how people were approaching the Aedes aegypti problem. And, um, you know, I, I saw a presentation on this technology, and we really just kind of started, um, you know, talking from there, interested in, you know, what was going on and, and how potentially in the future and, you know, now, 2021, um, we could collaborate on a project. Thanks, Andrea. Anything to add, Kevin? Um, well, that was great. I think that, that tells the story on the specific case. I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, Florida is kind of on the top of that northern distribution uh, of the species as it stands at the moment. And as such, uh, you know, it's a bit of a gateway, if you like, you know, into the US potentially for diseases as they maybe get imported. Um, and the mosquito is well established year round potentially in this region. So it's always nice to be able to um, have an impact in those areas where, where, where it's most needed. And, uh, and in terms of the US, the Florida is probably, Florida is probably the, the area that, um, that is most uh, at threat or at risk of disease transmission by Aedes aegypti. Thanks very much, Kevin and Andrea. The next question will go to you, Nathan. And just to say, we've got about three minutes left and we also have three questions left. So we might go over just a bit, but we're gonna try to work through these last three questions. So the last question, or sorry, the next question for you, Nathan, is are you worried that um, the Brazilian biologist Warwick Kerr experience in 1950 will happen again. He crossed the African bee with native European bees, and the result was an aggressive and difficult to control, I guess, bee. Um, it says, and then they wiped out the native bees. Do you, do you need me to repeat that, Nathan? No, I think that that's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that was a <laughs> pretty bad experience. Um, it's exactly as described there. He crossed a fairly aggressive African bee with native European bees, and they escaped from quarantine in Brazil uh, about 70 years ago. No, I'm not concerned that that's going to happen here because this is a very different situation. Our mosquitoes are actually designed to die. Um, those bees survived and spread because they were more fit and because they were able to outcompete the, the wild bees there. Uh, Oxitex mosquitoes are the exact opposite of that. They're actually designed... They have a, an inbuilt kill switch for the females, if you want to call it that. Um, and so we see rapidly plummeting populations when we release our mosquitoes rather than rapidly spreading populations. Um, and that's obviously why they've been designed in this particular way. It's because we want to actually reduce the population of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So uh, this is a very, very different situation to that. 
Thank you very much, Nathan. The next question is for you too. And the question is, how does Oxitec compare to Wabakia in terms of environmental impact? Okay, so Wabakia is another technology which also tries to stop mosquitoes from actually producing viable offspring. Um, and Wolbachia is a bacteria which uh, is used to infect mosquitoes. And if you release male mosquitoes that are infected with Wolbachia uh, and they mate with uninfected wild females, then their offspring will not be able to develop either. Um, and so in a sense, it's, it's the environmental impact is gonna be similar to the Oxitec mosquito. Um, neither of them will, will persist long-term in the wild. Um, both of them will be species specific, targeting just the Aedes aegypti mosquito as well. And so direct and indirect effects on other species in the environment will be very similar as well. Um, the difference is really going to be around whether Wolbachia mosquitoes are um, as easy to deploy as the Oxitec mosquito. And that's something where we think probably it's going to be easier in the long term to deploy the Oxitec mosquito in the field because you can basically put the eggs in a box and add water. With the Wolbachia mosquito, you need to produce the adult mosquitoes in the facility and then release the adult mosquitoes. Um, and that just makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, but in terms of the environmental impact, I'd expect them to be pretty similar. Thank you, Nathan. The next question is for Andrea. Andrea, the question is, Organophosphate chemical spraying will continue during this trial. Please explain how this resolves the organophosphate resistance issue. Why not stop spraying during the trial? So I think the, the main point I want to convey with that is we're not doing this, this particular project to um, you know, solve the resistance issue. We are um, conducting this project to reduce the population of Aedes aegypti. And when we're looking at any of these tools, we want to make sure that we can integrate it into what we're already doing. So the majority of our um, organophosphate applications are occurring due to salt marsh mosquitoes. Um, and we don't anticipate our salt marsh mosquito numbers to be down uh, during this trial. Uh, it will be conducted during, you know, the height of mosquito season. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we can continue controlling mosquitoes to the best of our ability. Um, and to do so, we will need to continue spraying. Now, this, this particular project is going to be set up to make sure that whatever's occurring in release areas is also occurring in, um, you know, what we're considering control areas, so non-release areas. That way, um, if we are spraying, we are treating both areas exactly the same. That way we know if any uh, if the reduction occurs that it's not due to, you know, insecticide spraying in one area that didn't occur in another. So um, that's really the important part is we need to make sure that we're, we're treating all of the release and control areas exactly the same. Um, but at the same time, we need to make sure at the Mosquito Control District that we are continuing to do our best to protect our citizens and our visitors. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, now we're, we've come to our last question of the evening. And Nathan, Nathan, this one is going to you. The question is, it says question for the panel. In your vast experience in this field, which hurdle is more rigorous, an independent scientific evaluation or EPA approval of an experimental use permit? Um, so I, I would say definitely the EPA. I think the, the list of studies, the amount of data, the rigor of the review from EPA is, is pretty much unmatched. Uh, they take the job very seriously. Um, they are very good scientists. And I think that they, they were very, very careful on assessing this particular project. Um, EPA is also the same. It's the same group of scientists, actually, that assessed the Wolbachia mosquito projects that have happened in different parts of the U.S., including the Florida Keys. Um, and so they are experts when it comes to assessing mosquito control tools, uh, whether it's the Oxitec mosquito, whether it's Wolbachia, whether it's other kinds of technologies as well. Um, but they were extremely rigorous. Thank you. 
Um, and I've done a lot of other academic publishing and, and so on, a lot of independent scientific reviews. I would still say EPA was more rigorous overall. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so this is the end of, of our questions, and I'd like to invite Andrea and Kevin to make any closing uh, remarks. Um, yeah, I just, again, want to thank everybody for their time. Um, we want to make sure that you know, we're reaching as many people as we can, answering questions, um, explaining what we're doing, uh, and, and really being open with this project. Um, even though we're not looking at doing releases until most likely March of 2021, um, we're going to use these next few months to make sure that um, we're reaching as many people as we can and, and talking about this. So I just really want to thank everybody for their time this evening. Um, and again, any further questions, please submit, give us a call. Um, we would love to, to talk more about the project. Super. Uh, uh, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I, I would I would emphasize the same. You know, just to say thank you for everybody and their time. Uh, it's great to get such good questions. It really uh, it really makes this worthwhile for us. Uh, and if anybody has further questions, just please feel free to use one of the contacts uh, available. And all of the information is available on octitech.com slash Florida. So please just you know, don't hesitate to go there. You'll be able to get all the regulatory documents, all the publications, and also have access uh, to both Octitech and FKMCD staff uh, where you can post further questions and get responses. So uh, yeah, just a great big thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. We hope you can join us again next month. Have a good evening. <laughs>